أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونتوب اليه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد given that we are celebrating a, a unifying day in this country and thanksgiving like probably any of the other national holidays that we have is one that cuts across denominations, affiliations, or all kinds of orientations and brings to focus really a theme of great importance. And as such, it is worth a theme to reflect on collectively. And I took the liberty to make this an invitation, inshallah, for all of us to reflect on this number today. And this would be our theme and our subject. Perhaps by far the single most difficult uh, and impactful thing that uh, took to prepare for this khutbah was to try to do what I ended up discovering later on was really an exercise in futility. And it was in fact stated in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, if you attempt to count, in other words, catalog the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can't quite do that. And I found myself, I caught myself halfway through the preparation of the khutbah, that I was exactly doing that. So I was driving through a catalog by trying to create classification to try to bring to focus into the discussion the blessings that come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that get bestowed upon us knowingly and then knowingly we either come to realize that they are there or we neglect them and just move on as if they are a fait accompli in life and we don't uh, think about it. So after I caught myself doing this, I kind of regrouped and thought, what would be perhaps a, a different approach without, without discounting the value as well as those blessings that touch our lives in every possible permutation, at every breath we take in every moment in our lives and just come to us and we take them for granted. I found that the Quran takes a position and offers us two starting points that are very good in order to wrap our arms around the size of what we are dealing with. The first one comes by way of Surah Al-Ma'idah, in which Allah says in an amazing verse, and it always gives me good goosebumps when I read it and I reflect upon it, because it says so much, so much, so much, and it says it so eloquently and it's almost a manner that is disarmingly simple. And that's always what eloquence is about. And when you say a lot with very few words, so you don't tax people, nor do you insult their intelligence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum. On this day, I have completed for you your religion. Wa alaykum ni'mati. And I have made my blessings, all of my blessings come to you in a complete manner. And I have chosen Islam for you as a religion. Subhanallah, probably this is the first time that I read this verse in the context of this theme that to me resonated with me in manners that were different from ways I understood it before. In other words, the, the mechanism for making it resonate differently with me was the idea of personalizing it instead of reading it much like we do readings. Well, today I have completed for you your religion. Well, that's completed for everyone. There isn't a personal experience in it. But when you realize that I, the sinner, the simple, the simple-minded person, 
I have been in the account of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he communicated to me as part of that community that I have today completed for you your religion. It gives a sense of humility and all to realize the attention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pays to each and every soul and to each and every creation in a manner that is proportionate to the reality of that soul and that creation as a caretaker. Because none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to do that and to do it with justice and with grace. And that was the amazing thing. And then he concludes this bestowing of all of the blessings by saying, and I am satisfied they have chosen for you Islam as your religion. So in other words, if you are looking for, and I'm going to use an analogy in other words to help me communicate it better. If you were looking for a gift basket to put all of the blessings that you are going to go and offer to someone in order to show them how much you care about them, clearly you would choose the best of gift baskets. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us that the gift basket in which he has put all of the blessings that are bestowed upon us happens to be our dear Islam. And subhanAllah, that's what kind of a light bulb when there is a wolf. That, that is something that is worth reflecting and, and pulsing on. And then later on, he teaches us the etiquette of taking that gift basket and appropriating it within our lives and be amongst those who are the recipients of this gift. And the way we respond then, we say, Alhamdulillah, Praise be to Allah who has accounted for us as amongst the recipients of this gift basket. And were it not for his guidance, we would not have been at the roll call. We could have missed the appointment. And you see that it's a double, uh, a double movement of the initiative being taken by Allah and then the further care of making sure it's not like I've sent the invitation and I'm sorry you got caught in traffic and you couldn't make the appointment, no. I've sent the invitation and I'm going to do everything possible to make sure that you show up at the time so you can be the beneficiary of those gifts and those blessings that come to you. Verily, Alhamdulillah, what a great, what a great blessing and it's just an absolute wonderful gift that comes to us. Now, one thing is certain in the language of the Quran is that a taraduf, when, uh, which is basically the Arabic term that says that you use a lot of sim similar wordings to describe something is seen by a number of scholars as not what the Quran is intended. So if you see the same idea or the same word or the same narrative reoccur in the Quran multiple times, it's not a direct repeat. There is always a nuance between a version one and version two and version three and version four. They are never an example because as you very well know, in, in any language, in composition and in writing, every author is chastised for being repetitive and making sure. So at least so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So clearly the repetition of certain things that might sound repetitive to us, that is not the intent, nor are they the purpose of the author. They point to a bigger idea, and it's the obligation of the reader to pull those things and understand them better. To that end, two words that seem to be interchangeably used in the Quran all over the place, almost always in pair, is the hand and the shukr, the praise and the gratitude, expression of praise and expression of gratitude. The opening chapter of the Quran opens with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And then this term of shukr, this three-letter word of shin, kaf, and ra, that comes into multiple variances that is essentially a verb, an active verb that describes the expression of gratitude, shows up multiple, multiple times in the Quran, sometimes paired up with the hand, and sometimes done separately, as is the case with most of our scholars, because of their incredible erudition, they are able to pull out the knowledge and the nuggets of learning from such things and make them available to us. So most scholars say that the purpose of the use of alhamd, when we say alhamdulillah, and we say very often when we translate it in English, we say thanks 
be to Allah or praise is Allah when we use those things. The praise and the thanks are meant to be an act of worship that is primarily emanating from the realization of the gifts that one has received and the recognition by gratitude of the tongue. In other words, it is uh, verbalizing the act of accepting the gift. So every time that somebody comes to you and offers a gift or does you a favor or something, the immediate reaction which is expected from the proper etiquette of dealing with one another is to say thank you and to acknowledge that that gesture meant something to you. So you say thank you. That's what the hand is when you express the gratitude in verbal form in order to align with the etiquette that is expected from the transaction between the two parties. So what is then a shukr? So what is this uh, bigger notion of expression of gratitude that is not that, that the Quran spends a lot of verses trying to end up? What the scholars say is that that form of expression of gratitude that is called the shukr in the Quran has to do with action. It doesn't have to do with verbal recognition of the kindness, but it has to do with taking that kindness, translating it into action, and making of that gift used in order to create a bigger impact. And that's a very powerful idea. So that, that and, and very often you have heard me from this place in the member make the case that really the hallmark of Islam, one of the unique things about Islam as a religious experience is always in its phenomenology. It's not in the way it preaches things. It's not in the way it asks for things to be repeated. It's in the way it animates who we are, so we become change agents for good to change ourselves, to change our environments, and to change our communities. So it's not, and I always made the point that, for example, one of the reasons for which to me, it's critical that every starting point of a calendar of a religion is always something that has to do with the birth of some mobility or a birth of a person or the, the, the revelation of something. Except when it comes to Islam, the birth of Islam, in terms of its clock, is tied to the hijrah. It always suggests movement, movement from a state to a better state, movement from a condition to a better condition, movement from something that is in need of help and healing towards healing it and giving it more help. And this is a hallmark of Islam. It's a unique thing. And throughout the history of Islam, this thinking has animated people to do things that are very bold and extraordinarily impactful. It's like child's play today to get on a plane and kind of fly to Singapore from Boston. It may take you like 12 or 14 hours. And yes, your back will, your back will ache because of the size of the seat. But nonetheless, you don't think about the trials and tribulations of travel. And yet there were some Muslims in the early days who got on a camel, who got on the back of a donkey and decided to head for Singapore. That's a much more serious undertaking in having faith in the future. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know how you'd get animated by something like this, crossing mountains and seas and climates and hordes of killers and all kinds of things, so you make it to your destination. Are you not driven by, were you not driven by a purpose that idea would, need, would never even cross your mind because in a simple analysis of risk versus the reward, there is no reward in that. It's absolute insanity. And that's the same thing of this hero that we read about, whose name is Tarak ibn Ziyad, this Berber hero who was on the uh, north side of the uh, <coughs> Moroccan Peninsula today. And when he saw the sea in front of him, and he felt that his mission in life was to take Islam to a new continent that's called Europe, he took a leap of faith. The man crossed an entire sea. He went on the other side and then turned to everybody else and says, well, the ships that we have used to cross, I started them. Now they are at the bottom of the ocean. What are we going to do beyond this point? That's bold leadership. And this bold leadership of giving thanks does not come from pontification or verbal announcement of the expression of leadership. 
It is the force that animates from inside in order to be transformational of oneself. Then it makes sense. That's what is the hallmark of Islam. This reality, this, uh, this invitation, this engine, if you wish, and this sense of purpose and translation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us realize that this caretaking process that's been given to us in this gift basket that's called Islam started very early. We were beneficiaries of it in a state of unconsciousness. That's why I called it before the gratitudes of the known and the hidden. In Surah the Nahd, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this action towards us by saying, بَدْعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ It is Allah, through his direct intervention, that gave you life by bringing you out of the wombs of, their, of your mothers. You want to realize the impact of what that means? Just be witness to childbirth. Talk to healthcare professionals about the possibilities of the things that could possibly go wrong in an instant. And then you start realizing the power of the blessing about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse takes appropriation of the act of coming to this life from the womb himself. He, said, he says, it is he who has brought you out so you can have this life infused into you. And then he describes our condition as we come from the wombs of our mothers. You know absolutely nothing. And subhanAllah, from all of the categories of mammals, probably the single most helpless creature that comes out from childbirth in the mammalian food chain are the humans. Every other creature is four-legged or under the sea. The creature of an orca or the creature that comes from something else and they give birth instantly upon birth, there is some independence of the newborn the calf, the baby, the whatever, that has a, an ability to survive, except the human. If we are not surrounded and nurtured with an entire system and set of institutions around us, our survival chances are very low. Why? It's because I says, I'm taking care of you. You know nothing as you, as you started this. And he has bestowed upon you. These are not accidents. I understand that there is a, like a biological explanation for how from a DNA encoding and those chromosomes you get passed on to you that they transform into the organs that you get. But to make those organs function so they become sensory organs that function as intended, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also takes appropriation for this. It is he who has given you. Note, he didn't say he has given you ears and eyes. He has given you the faculty to hear and the faculty to see. Because it's not a single organ. It's the wiring process. It's the communication of the, sing the signals that go back and forth. It's the processing capability that takes within that and whatnot. And all of that blessing comes given to you. Guess how he ends the verse? How does the verse end? So you may give thanks to Allah for having been given this gift. Right? So that's what it is about. So that's what I call, it's always in, in the movement that these things happen. So is there a purpose to this uh, uh, incredible generosity from our creator for caring and dispensing these blessings in manners that are overt and sometimes manners that are hidden that we might not perceive. Yes, there is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ Remember me, and I will remember you. وَشْكُرُونِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ And show gratitude towards me, and do not be amongst those who reject. And if you do that, then in Surah Ibrahim, he goes on further to say, Allah has committed upon himself 
that if you approach him with acknowledgement and gratitude of his blessings, he will add to your blessings more. Just subhanAllah, friends, the, the, the beauty of this caregiver. In our human conditions, if you are very charitable and the person asks you the first time and the second time and the third time, boy, by the time they get to the fourth time and they ask you, you start wishing that they don't ring your doorbell. It's just human nature, like, uh, okay, so what's going on here? So we start passing through the foul play of the something it is. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you couldn't be like more generous and you couldn't think of him in more, in more extraordinary terms. The more you ask me, the more I give. This is why we say, Alhamdulillah, very big praise to Allah who has guided us towards this. So what makes, uh, what makes this exercise of shukr, of expressing gratitude, Islam? There are certainly many ways and many purposes to motivate ourselves and many people do as to why they engage in this sort of reciprocity. Some are altruistic. There are a lot of people who do good for the sake of doing good. There are a lot of people who do good in a transactional manner. You did something good for me. I'm going to do something good for you to pay you back. So it's a payback argument, etc. And, and we can elaborate on this, but it need not take our time. So there are many ways. So what makes things that are basically Islamic? There are a couple of points that I would suggest to you are key differentiators in how this gratitude is described in the Quran that I have not seen in other places that seem to be, to me at least, my own understanding rather unique about our worldview of Islam. The first one, يَقُولُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى فِي سُورَ الْطَاهَى In the chapter of Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this, this verse. And this verse was directed to Banu Israel. And he tells them the following thing. كُلُوا مِنْ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ Consume from those goods that we have provided for your sustenance. وَلَا تَطْخَوْ فِيهِ And do not transgress on this blessing that has been given to you because of the consequence. فَيَحِلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ غَضَبِي You will suffer my wrath or you will say the expression of my wrath in this. So that's the unique first differentiation. So what is that differentiation and what does it mean? It means that the sense, the sense of recognizing that the blessings come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be caretakers of those blessings comes with the joy of enjoying them, but it comes with the responsibility of not transgressing upon them. And it takes a balancing act between these two things. There are people, subhanAllah, who Allah gives them the gift of the intellect. Well, be careful of not playing the game of Parun, who went back later on when people asked him about how amass his wealth. He said, I, I did it all, it's all because of me. That's a form of transgression against Allah's blessings in intellect, in wealth, in health, in everything. So there is always a sense, a sense that we are custodian of something that has been given to us on a borrowed time, and we have an obligation to return it in a condition that is equal or better than the way we took it. Because if you look at human life, the span of human life, and how extraordinarily has, it has expanded over time, just go back about 1500 years ago, or not even that, 700 or, eight year, or 800 years ago, arriving to 40 years of age was a miracle because you had to fight disease and you had to fight hygiene and you had to fight things. Infant mortality was catastrophic. And then suddenly we started to conquer these things. What's the outcome of this? A lifespan. What used to be only 40 years old as a cutoff grew to become 60 years old as a cutoff. Now it's probably in the eighties and people are talking about growth hormones and life extension therapies and all things of that nature where the horizon of the triple digits has become very real. I mean, the 100 year old is not something that is anathema or catastrophic. It's within reach. 
The question is then, what do we do with that blessing? Never to transgress on it is the first lesson that makes the sense of gratitude Islamic. Second one, know that the realization of being grateful, when you realize that you have become grateful, that realization, not the gift, not the gift, the realization itself is a gift from Allah. That's kind of an important idea. Ibn Allah al-Iskandarani says it in a, in, a, in a very, very eloquent way. He says, لا تدهشنك واردات النعم عن القيم بحقوق الشكر Let not uh, the, the experience of having received the blessing distract you from the reality that you have been given the gift to recognize that this comes to you from Allah. Because many others don't. Right? So it's always guidance. In other words, the guidance comes always from Allah. The third thing which I think is, is the most important one which I will conclude the khutbah, inshallah ta'ala, is this expression of what I call the gratitude in motion. How to be uh, energized, motivated, moved to act on behalf of the learning and on behalf of the things that animates us from our religion. I found this interesting quote and I was reading it like a couple of days ago and it was very intriguing to me. It comes from Herbert Hoover here in the US. I wrote it a long time ago, obviously, when he was alive. And he says the following thing. It was a message that he published on Thanksgiving Day. And I'm quoting, that's him speaking. He says, our forefathers endured the hardships and privations of a primitive life. They nevertheless bequeathed to us a custom of devoting one day of every year to universal thanksgiving. These two are statements of facts. Now he has an invitation for the nation on what to do. These are for blessings of life and the means to sustain it. And that I think is very insightful on what it means. These are blessings of life and the means to sustain it. And then I said, subhanAllah, I remember a verse that roughly describes this, but it's more in the language of the Quran, and it comes in Surah Saba, and that's verse number 13 for those of you who want to look it up later on, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'malu ala Dawood al-shukra. O people of David, act upon, engage into the expression of gratitude in action. And very, very few are from my people, those who know or have the skill to translate this learning into action. So it's important to realize, as I always insist, the Islamic teaching is always about faith in motion. It's not about static piling up of accumulation of knowledge to pack the information without making it a force that animates us for good and to do good. What's the fourth and the last characteristic of what makes this form of expression of gratitude unique to Islam, I believe? It's to be grateful in good times and in bad times. So I think intuitively we all get the idea of being grateful in good times. So what does it mean to be grateful in bad times and hard times? Well, that's, that's unique to us. Zara Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-ma'atin ismuha Umm Sa'id. And she was running a very high fever. What's up with you? So he was inquiring about her health because he could see the condition of her. Qalid. In the eloquent Arabic language, she has described her fever with a derogatory explanation. Sometimes we use that in our common language. Somebody has been afflicted with a horrible disease with a terrible thing. We, we take the liberties to transgress against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by not showing him the proper etiquette in knowing that everything that happens from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to our eyes, it has that expression. And obviously we are human, our emotions react to the suffering, but we need this balancing act to have God present in our lives at all times, during the good times and during the hard times as well. 
She goes on in order to make her grief and pain palpable to, to the Prophet Muhammad. And she says about her disease, Akhzah Allah, may God curse this disease, this, this fever that I am having, that I am having. The Prophet Muhammad responded in the following way. Qala, let us subiha. Don't, don't insult your disease. فَإِنَّهَا تُنَقِّ الْفَقْرَ وَالذُّنُوبِ this, this fever that you are experiencing, it is purging and purifying from you poverty and your sins. كَمَا يُنَقِّ الْكِيرُ خَبَثِ الْحَدِيرِ Exactly in the same manner in which fire purifies the infinity, the impurities from men. And I think that that's what it means to be a believer. Let me make sure that I don't get misinterpreted in what I said here. I don't mean to say that if we get afflicted with something, our idea then is to simply sit down and let the disease eat us up because we are in an act of worship. That would be silly and that would be exact, exactly against the teaching of Islam. But that what this means is that as we strive towards mentally and spiritually in trying to conquer a condition or heal ourselves in Islam, there is always an ethical point of view. There's a certain way to do it. We don't do it by revolting and, insane, and, and inciting and, and, and insulting and doing all kinds of things. A Muslim is always a Muslim, is always a Muslim under all circumstances. And probably I couldn't think of a better way to cut the entire khutbah than to give the voice to Romi to let him say it in his own words about what this is about. He says, where gratitude like a clock, and it will feed every corner of your life. How beautiful and how true. Quote from the other, Mr. Kirillai, Mr. Kirillai, I want to begin uh, by announcing that uh, a very dear sister of mine, Sister Sepi, who used to be in this community now and uh, who has moved on, has sent me a note to say that uh, she knows of a brother who's uh, in a difficult health condition, is going to be undergoing some difficult surgery. And she said, uh, if we could, inshallah, make dua for him. We will follow the Sunnah of the Prophet in these matters, in which he used to say, Allahumma rabbid nas, idhib al bas, ishfid in the shaykh, ishifa Allah, yuhadi wa sallam ahna bada. Roughly translated, it says, O Allah, the bond of people, we ask that you heal our brother and you heal him in a condition where he will never be afflicted by anything else. I mean, Asadullah uh, is a vision. أنه يشفي مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين وأسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يجعل القرآن العظيم شفاء لنا ولصدورنا وذهاب لأمومنا وغمنا وحزننا اللهم قوي به بسالنا وثقل به ميزاننا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سيدنا كثيرا وآخر الصلاة إن الصلاة تنهى عن الشيء الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن يدعو الله ورسوله هيا عليه الصلاة هيا عليه الصلاة ودبارة السلام ودبارة الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله